Hi there, my name is Mike Bankhead. I am a bass player and songwriter from Dayton, Ohio. It's the Gem City. On today's podcast, I talk to Marissa Buxbaum, who I think everyone re- affectionately refers to her as Bucks. So, the Bucks it is. And we happen to have some uh, similar interests. One of them is we are both huge fans of a band called Fountains of Wayne out of New Jersey. One of their two main songwriters was a gentleman named Adam Schlesinger, and he died on April 1st, 2020. Now, Bucks and I had this conversation back in December of 2021, and I knew that I was going to air it on April 1st of 2022 to coincide with the two-year anniversary of Adam Schlesinger passing away from COVID-19. He was also a bass player and a songwriter and heavily influential on the kind of music that I make. And we discuss in loving and affectionate detail the debut self-titled Fountains of Wayne album. And I think you'll be able to hear how much both of us uh, really love these songs and love this band. There we go. I guess it doesn't tell you that it's doing it twice. <laughs> Apparently not. Hey, Marissa, welcome. Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. I am pleased because you share a love of Adam Schlesinger and Fountains of Wayne with me. I do very much so, yes. He's a, a songwriter who's very, very close to my heart and who has only become uh, more so in recent years for admittedly tragic reasons. And I agree with that. I'm a bass player who writes songs. He was a bass player who writes songs. We are a rare breed. But I want to say that something that you wrote about Adam Schlesinger is the reason I reached out to you in the first place. And for the listeners, I'm going to tell this story briefly, and then I'll shut up and we'll get to the main topic. There is a podcast I really enjoy listening to about 90s music called the Dig Me Out podcast. Now, you super music nerds out there will know what record that name comes from, and the rest of you will not. And I know we're probably not supposed to plug other podcasts on our own podcast, but it's great, (laughs) and it's entertaining, and not only do I enjoy hearing discussion about records that I'm familiar with, I enjoy learning about music that I somehow missed in the 90s. And Marissa was a guest on an episode where they talked at length about Muse, another band that I happen to love. And so I go to the show notes, and I see that she has a blog. I go to her blog, and this is something that Marissa wrote. I'm going to quote you, Marissa. Oh, wow. I'm flattered. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's like great. It It was the blog entry you did when you found out that Adam had died, and you were expressing your feelings. Here's the quote that made me email you. To Schlesinger, songwriting was not a means to an end for stardom. Songwriting was the end in itself, self-evidently necessary, an expression of obsessive love and devotion and respect. Like, that's how I feel about songwriting, and that resonated with me. So I sent you an email, which... Sometimes when you send strangers an email, you don't know if like they'll be like, well, who is this creepy person? But you answered. We had a nice conversation, and now we're music buddies, and now you're here to talk about Adam Schlesinger, and specifically the first record he made with Chris Collingwood under the Fountains of Wayne name. Yes, it was. Uh, I've, I've come into uh, many music buddy friendships now at this point through the Dig Me Out podcast. So, um, And I found that specifically with this uh sphere of pop rock power pop whatever you want to call it that it's it's kind of a a small world that the the devotion and appreciation uh is is intense so when you find somebody who's on your wavelength you want to talk to them about it agreed so while we are having this conversation in december of 2021 You, dear listener, are listening to this on April 1st, 2022, which is exactly two years since COVID-19 claimed Adam Schlesinger's life. And as we all know, it has claimed millions of lives globally, and it's awful. 
But enough about the awful part. Let's go to the part that makes us feel joy. We're going to talk about the first Fountains of Wayne album. But before we do that, I would like Marissa to tell you folks how she discovered this band. Now, it's in this blog entry, but I, I want to hear her talk about it. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's my recollection of it is not crystalline. Um, uh, certainly not as much so as the, the day that Adam passed. But I know that the first song that I ever heard was Stacy's Mom. Um, it was my freshman year of high school, and it was in regular rotation um, on TV, on the radio, back when, you know, TV played music videos and, and back when radio was still very much a thing instead of streaming. And I heard it, and I had that instantaneous, you know, some songs are growers. For me, it was immediate. Uh, I, I just fell in love because to me, it sounded like, um, you know, what, what I grew up with as a, as a little kid listening to Around the House, which was the Beatles, you know, Meet the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night. It, for me, it was um, uh, immediate and recognizable as that substance of music that um, is, is very close to my heart and deeply familiar. So that was the start of it. Um, and I bought the album and probably wore it out. Uh, <laughs> and um, it was only really gradually as I got older um, in high school and in college that I really branched out to the other records, to um, the self-titled, to Utopia Parkway. And um, my, I, I, I sort of, I, I want to say, fell off with them for a bit. I never got to see the band live, which I, I deeply regret. But I, I came back to them, revisited them uh, somewhat obsessively in the years um, uh, prior. So, like, I want to say maybe 2018, 2019 was when I started getting heavy duty into Fountains of Wayne again. How long did it take you to go discover their, their debut album, which is uh, self-titled? You know, that was the uh, sort of, I, I feel like that was the last one to really gel with me. And I'm not sure why <laughs> that's the case, but it was really, I want to say like this past week, honestly, going back over it, um, realizing, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this is the Fountains of Wayne blueprint. It has everything in it that you associate with the band, um, not just melodically, but thematically, every, you know, all their sort of uh, narrative hallmarks. It it really does. That album came out, the internet tells me, in October of 1996. How old were you in October of 1996, might I ask? Uh, how old was I in October of 1996? Uh, I apologize. I have a breakthrough case of COVID. I'm fine, but I'm still a little brain fried from it. So um, I, I think I can do math. Um, I was born in 1988. So I was, oh my gosh, I was uh, eight years old. Okay. I graduated high school in 1996, and this <laughs> album was released a few months after I graduated. So I was 18. Obviously, I'm exactly 10 years older than you. I discovered this on the radio back when occasionally big corporate radio might actually play something decent. Strangely enough, Radiation Vibe was, a, was on the radio. Yeah, it was a minor hit, I think. Yeah. And then I got the album and in instant repeat. At this point, I didn't have the rest of their career, right? I just had that album. And <laughs> yeah, you, you got to go along for the for the ride. Um, it's interesting because upon revisiting it, it it does feel to me, and this might be an artifact of of the record being a, a very fast affair. If, if memory serves, it was recorded in like a week or something. Yeah, quickly. Um, it, it's the most rough around the edges Fountains of Wayne record. It's, it's a little less polished than the ones that come after it. Definitely as far as the production and the sheen put on them on the recording, yes. I find the quality of the songs is the same. But yeah. I agree with you modern young people that are used to modern rock production might have, might struggle with this record. I still love it. I, 
I'm an old guy. I love it. It just brings back memories of my youth. And yeah, it's quick. It, listen, it's, thirty minutes and it's over, right? I know, it, and that is uh, that. That's the beauty of pop rock guitar music, right? It, it's it's um, the 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 beauty of the craft is that you're making something that's just so easily digestible. It it goes down like candy practically when done right. <laughs> when done right. So I actually did see them on the tour for this album. They were opening for Smashing Pumpkins. And I caught that show shortly after Smashing Pumpkins kicked Jimmy Chamberlain out of the band because of their keyboardist's heroin overdose and death. It was a great uh, show. You know, that, that's, that's, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because if you had not mentioned that, I never would have put together the uh, root um, from Fountains of Wayne to Tinted Windows. Like I, To me, it was entirely mysterious that James E. Ha was in that band. Oh, really? And now it makes a little more sense. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I'd never thought of it that way. I mean, clearly, they obviously had made friends. If they weren't already friends by the time they did that tour, they made friends on that tour. But that association clearly, yeah, it goes way, way back. We're going to have to have you back to talk about that Tended Windows record someday. <laughs> Not that, today. That was but... another album I loved, yes. Yeah, and, and was an instant, yeah, latched onto it instantly as well. So Founds of Wayne, beautiful album cover. Not the only album with that same cover. Did you know this? Yeah, I read that too when I was uh, doing some of my, uh, you know, sort of refresher research for this podcast. I, I realized, yeah, that's, that was kind of a dick move on on behalf of the uh, of the photographer. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, the the person who took that picture um, let more than one band use it for their album cover. So it looks outstanding and unique, and it is, but it's been used on more than one album. This is... Although, to Fountains of Wayne's credit, that is the only album that, that, that I associate with that photograph. I have not seen it wherever else it has appeared. So Agreed. I've seen internet pictures of the other album. I couldn't even tell you who made the other album, which says something to me about... There you go. One of them has stood the test of time. Do you have a favorite song on this album? Now we're going to get into the super nerdy stuff. Oh yeah, that's um that's tough. I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of Radiation Vibe. I love Sink to the Bottom, Joe Ray. I think my number one is probably Barbara H. You're not allowed and... to say that because that's my number one, and now I'm gonna have to pick another one. <laughs> well, I'm glad we both have a superlative taste, clearly. And I, I mean it's to me it's a flawlessly composed song, as pretty much all Fountains of Wayne songs are, but it also to me exemplifies something that Fountains of Wayne does extraordinarily well, which is despite the two principal songwriters being men, they have this way of centering uh, women's subjectivity in a lot of their songs. Um, there are two of them here, I think, uh, Barbara H. and Sick Day, but also um, The Summer Place, No Better Place. These are not just songs, I mean, they have plenty of songs where they're addressing women, or songs that are named after women like Denise or Maureen, but but these are actually written from the perspective of uh, you know the stories that they're trying to tell of these women. So I always found that to be really striking because it's not something that all rock musicians do well or all that common. That gives me something to shoot for. <laughs> the chorus in this song is perfect. It's perfect. Yes. The solo is perfect. Like I know, and there's a that was something that I found myself noticing a lot throughout the album was just how much these guitar squalls pop in about three quarters of the way through the song, and you just sort of coast on them like a like a wave. It's so much fun. That is so much better than I would describe it. <laughs> as a, as a non guitar player who doesn't know how to write a solo. I learned so much about how long to give your guitar player to play a solo from the way <laughs> Collingwood and Schlesinger write their songs. It's a master class in pacing, yeah. And, and and in um lyricism too, in a lot of ways. You know, they sort of they, they arrived fully formed, didn't they? I think they had been writing together for a while before they decided to actually make the record. Even though, as you said, they did put they put these songs together really quickly. And I have read 
now I'm going to have to go research this to see how if my memory is correct. I have read that they were just trying to crack each other up in the studio and pulling just crazy names for songs out of their head. And then one of them would be like, oh, I gotta write that one. And then after... I mean, it, if it works, you know, go with it. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that even though, you know, it's it's obvious to me as well that these are, you know, two guys trying to, to entertain each other, um, none of the subject matter ever reads to me as like cruel or, or mocking in any way. And it's a kind of a delicate balance that they're striking between cracking a joke that requires like some level of ironic detachment. Um, but it also reads as very earnest, or at least I interpret it as being earnest. And I think that, uh, that they want you to laugh, um, but they want you to laugh more in appreciation and in recognition and in like delight it's it's never sneering and and they're not reducing their observations of these these people's lives to these people are caricatures because they they expect that you'll see yourselves in these songs and i imagine that they probably see themselves in them too i mean th these are largely um the characters in fountains of wayne songs they're all like exceedingly mundane uh regular people these existentially frustrated office drones with like fantasies of drama and romance and, and catharsis, but who are ultimately, you know, kind of complacent, spinning their wheels, going in circles. Uh, so very recognizable to me personally. I mean, I am neither a bass player nor a songwriter, but like Adam Schlesinger, I am uh, a tri-state Jew uh, who grew up, you know, in the same sort of milieu that, that uh, Chris Collingwood and, and Adam Schlesinger did. So that to me, it's recognizable from a, a sort of narrative standpoint. This is going to be an awesome segue opportunity because I was going to ask you, as a resident of New York City, how it makes you feel that this band has so many references to actual places in New Jersey and New York and their music. I love it. I love it so much. And you know, it, it's not just New York City either. I mean, my, my parents uh, live in Connecticut. My dad's from New Haven. So anytime there's a reference to anything, practically, I, I will recognize it. Uh, you know, just, just being, I, I commute from the New York suburbs uh, to my job, or at least I did for years prior to uh, COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I, I love uh, one of my favorite Fountains of Wayne songs is Acela because God knows how many times I've been on an Amtrak train from one part of the Northeast corridor to the other. So yeah, it, it's it, the incredible feeling of listening to not just an incredibly catchy song that you love, but this this ease of like transferring your identity into it, of, of feeling like you're becoming a protagonist. And I love that about it. For songwriters who are listening, you're probably saying, don't the, quote, songwriting experts say that you should avoid being specific in your music when about naming places and locations so that it can be universal? Yes, they do say that. Ignore that nonsense. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest. I've only been in New York as a tourist. And even though I definitely notice all of the very specific references in the Collingwood Schlesinger songs, the songs are great. If the song's good enough, that doesn't matter. But... Right, right. It sort it reminds me of um, so the one of my other favorite bands is is Oasis, and there are a ton of Oasis songs which include patently nonsense lyrics like "slowly walking down the hall faster than a cannonball." Where were you while we were getting high? Now, if if you are not singing that, you know, in front of a stage while the band is playing or at karaoke they read to you as, you know, Looney Tunes. But when you are singing along, when you are hearing it in your headphones or in a crowd, it becomes suddenly profound. And I find that with Fountains of Wayne, you know, it, it doesn't matter if they're saying, lead us not into Penn Station, or uh, if you've never been on an Amtrak before, chances are you've been on a train and you've had the feeling of headphones on, looking out the window, you know, having these thoughts about your life and where you're going and if you're going anywhere. And that's something that that Fountains of Wayne taps into um, with, to me, this like incredible profundity. Um, and, and there's a universality, I think, in at least in America, to like the tension between growing up uh, in the suburbs and having these dreams about life in a big city 
and then getting there and, you know, maybe perhaps having to recalibrate your expectations a little. And that's exactly what Barbara H is about, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, I should clarify that those of us in the Midwest, most most folks out here have never been on a train in their life because we don't have them. But uh, <laughs> everyone has been in a car listening to headphones. But like just the beginning of Barbara H, she's a small girl. She's took a bus to the big city and it talks about her feelings and the radio's playing the same song 78 times and it gets stuck in her head. Those are, you can relate to that, even if you're not from near a big city, I think. Yes. And I can say, you know, with uh, complete uh, sincerity that I, I know what it's like to have a big crush that makes you want to break stuff and then blame it on some guy you don't know. <laughs> it's a genius lyric. Yeah, they they have a a th th this way of locating a poetry in the most um, sort of banal, otherwise banal details. Um, the universality of of you know um, life and and not an exciting life, but just the life that probably the majority of us are living right now, where we're just trying to get by day to day. Yep. So since you picked that one as your favorite, and I want to be. I mean, it's my favorite too, but I'm going to elevate my second favorite for the for the sake of this conversation. And that's She's Got a Problem, which illustrates very much something you were saying earlier. It could seem derisive because they're saying the person who is the subject of this song. She's could, got some issues. She might do something dumb. Yeah. <laughs> but the person talking is not making fun of the subject. The person right, is expressing some her. genuine concern, and because of the way that the melody works with their composition, it comes off sweet. Yeah, it it's it is the same sweetness um, that tempers "I've Got a Flair," you yeah. know, which you think is is basically the band bragging about being a terrible nuisance to uh, the woman who's the object of of their affection. But in, instead of reading as, you know, kind of a bratty, snotty, or frat bro-ish, on the contrary, it's, it's endearing. Nerd rock. Exactly. Maybe that's why and, I like and, it so and the, much. To me, it's the best kind of nerd rock. There, there, are, there are forms of nerd rock that, that rub me the wrong way, uh, Weezer being the, I think, glaring example. But with Fountains of Wayne, it has never crossed over the line for me, even when it has been, you know, taking the piss, so to speak, it has never been in a way where it um, becomes repellent to me because there, there is fundamentally uh, at the base of it, a, a, an empathy and, and a recognition of like the, the self in the other. And two more reasons that might be the case. One is the song craft. Yep. I'm amazed at the attention to detail in their songs. And when I learn this the most is when I sit down at a piano and jump on the internet to find chords and try to learn a bunch of Founds and Wayne songs on the piano. And I mean, songwriters, if you want to learn like how one should write a bridge, go teach yourself Founds and Wayne songs. That's, <laughs> this is, that's how you should write bridges. Just do whatever they do. I got nothing else. Um, but also there's a, just a little touch of melancholy even oh, yeah. in their songs when they're being funny. Yep. There, there's um, always that contrast between the, the humorous and the tragic, the, uh, the boring and the sort of electrifying. And yeah, I, I feel like that in, in, in songwriting in general is the most intoxicating ingredient, the, the ability to contrast opposing elements in some way um, right down to power pop as a genre which is a way of finding to me at least the new and the exciting in the oldest and most familiar bag of tricks that exists right like four chords four power chords a backbeat some vocal harmonies it's all just you know different slightly different permutations on the same basic structure but if you land it right you've got pure magic sorcery like the most to me the most addicting kind that there is to listen to 
It is. And these guys landed at, I mean, that's gym, gymnastic turn. Stuck the landing, no bounce. Yep. Yep. So, and and it's shocking to me that they that they have been so phenomenally consistent. Like I, I I couldn't think off the top of my head of like a Fountains of Wayne dud that I just don't appreciate on some level when I hear it. This is a band that wrote a country song, and I don't even <laughs> like country songs, and I love that song. <laughs> That's on a different record. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> we'll get to it, yeah. So here's a question for you. Can you tell the difference between the songs that Adam wrote and the songs that Chris wrote on this record? I will be honest with you. I can't. I was looking um, for, I, I was Googling, you know, going through with a fine tooth comb to see if I could get a definitive answer uh, to differentiate between the ones that I suspected were Chris and the ones that I suspected were Adam. Um, and I think there was one occasion where I actually got it reversed. I, I, I could have sworn to you that Joe Ray was Adam Schlesinger, and I think it is actually Chris Collingwood. Really? Yeah, but there, there, there it was not a lot of information that I was readily able to dig up. It, it it seems like in the years since 1996, the the songwriting credit, uh, which is democratically shared between the two of them, has has become you know like accepted as the whole thing is just the two of them working together. And from my understanding, that was the record where they they were quite the, the most collaborative, and and that they really only started uh, diverging on, in, in subsequent albums. But yeah, it, whatever alchemy they they had going on, um, they they gelled beautifully because they're effectively indistinguishable to me. So I learned something on Twitter that gives the clue, and because we just cite our sources, the source is Max Collins from Eve Six, who is a voracious <laughs> tweeter, one of the best uh, posters, tweeters, uh, currently active. And to his ever-loving credit, he loves this band so much. <laughs> uh, and he toured with them, so he knows them personally as well. And what he said in a tweet once was, Adam wrote the songs that are telling you a narrative story. Chris wrote the songs that are abstract. Oh, fascinating. Which, which is I... why I would have put Joe Ray in the Adam bucket. Yeah, yeah, and... Um, if, look, I, I need to fact check that for all I know. I've got too. it reversed. <laughs> um, and you, you can add a footnote to the podcast, you know, by the way, Bucks was dead wrong on this one, but, um, I, th that's fascinating. And th that is actually, in fact, something I noticed while listening to the album is that there were these songs that, uh, follow a linear narrative and there are the songs like, um, trying to think of what an example of, of an abstract song would be. Radiation from the vibe? Album. Yeah, radiation what is, vibe. What is, an, what is a radiation vibe? I don't know I don't what know. that is. Or Sink to the Bottom. Is, or Sink to the is... Bottom. But Joe Ray came from Spain, and... I know, that that's very much, a, you know, we're, we're getting people, places, and things there, yeah. You can kind of sort the album, if, if we are correct, if Max is, and I would, you know, Max is probably never wrong. If Max is correct with that statement, it, it does let you kind of sort these songs into one bucket or another, right? Barbara H. tells a story, that's got to be an Adam song. Sick Day tells a story, that's got to be an Adam song. And that, by that logic, I suppose I've Got a Flare is a Chris Collingwood song. Yeah. Leave the Biker kind of tell, tells a story that's, and it sounds goofy. I feel like of the yeah. two of them, Adam is the, was the goofier one. Yeah, he, he was a little more um, freewheeling, I think, in his embrace of the comedic elements of the band. I, what a fantastic record. It was like... Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you, I'm so happy that you asked me to do this because it forced me to go back and review my, um, I, I love the album, but it was one that was very much not fresh in my memory. You don't play anything, do you? That's correct. I do not. Um, I am married to a musician. He's he's an engineer, a producer, a mixer, a sort of uh, jack of all trades, Swiss Army knife kind of music guy. 
uh, classically trained and everything, went to, I met him at SUNY Purchase. He was in the conservatory there. I was just a a lowly liberal arts major. (laughs) We met at a party. But uh, I have um, only ever obsessively listened and enjoyed and admired from afar. I've never actually uh, picked up an instrument and, and played one. So with your gift for words and writing, I feel like you. you could probably write lyrics. I would love to do that, you know, and, and I feel like if if my husband ever gets back into the swing of, of pop rock songwriting again, um, I might, you know, scribble some things down and yeah, give it a go. But it, it it's it's amazing, to, like the the songcraft and the storycraft that Fountains of Wayne have managed to put together and and make their their trademark. You know, I, I feel like it was very hard. I feel like it would be very hard for any other band to make that work in the way that they made it work. I mean, Slacker, I feel- power pop you know, like with a, with a slight existentialist bent, you know what I mean? I'm trying, but I haven't managed to get there. Mm-hmm. What do you think of, all right. So sink to the bottom has what sounds like a $4 Casio in it. Yeah, you're right. But it works. <laughs> it does. What do you think of them breaking out? That could not have possibly been a very expensive studio keyboard, but it works. Yeah, and they, I I do like that um, resourcefulness and and creativity and willingness to just I th- I think it again it is the goof around impulse you know what I mean I I think that they were just trying to see what they could accomplish in that one week and you know in in a way paradoxically the kind of the pressure is off in that sense you know like you you got one week to bang something out. These, these guys have been working and writing together uh, for however long previously, so so they're comfortable and they're familiar. It's kind of, let, let's throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And everything stuck. <laughs> everything stuck. Is there anything on this album that you think did not age well? Huh. That's a, that's a very good question. Um no, I mean, granted, I'm very biased because I, I love this band and, and you know, hindsight being what it is and, and nostalgia being what it is. I feel like my appreciation for them has only deepened and, and intensified. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like a song that, that could, that threatened maybe to not age as well would be something like Leave the Biker, just because, you know, the, the, the biker could become a caricature just the the details that we're we're throwing out here of of him you know having scars all over his face or you know i I bet this guy hasn't ever read a a word that hasn't been in a porno mag you know these are things that that could i think in less deft songwriters hands have become cheap or become goofy silly but it's not it's it's still just the, the world's most charming song I was going to say leave the biker too, but it was mostly for the slur. Oh yeah. Yeah. However, in context, it's not the songwriter saying that the songwriter is right. quoting someone else. So yeah, if he's, he's I, painting if I this picture ima- of a dirt bag. Yeah. So if I put them on, on my imagination. I could understand someone be offended, someone being offended by that. I could get it. And if I were to cover that song in public, and by the way, I'm going to share this secret with you that I haven't told anyone other than maybe 20 or 30 other people. I have a burning desire to get a band together and just go somewhere and just play this song in order. Just play this record in order. Like just go cover the whole thing one to 12. Boom, 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 boom. That would be amazing. Hey, you should take the show to New York. I'll be in the front row. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, I was thinking Sometime when I do one of those album release shows that we indie artists do and for our community and you play your album, your brand new one straight, I was like, I would love to do an album release show, play my record front to back, take a three minute break, and then just run through Fountains of Wayne. And I wouldn't even tell anyone what I was doing. I would just start, we would just start playing all the songs. And if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, you're going to love these songs anyway, because they're great. Yeah, exactly. They're, it's, the, the appeal is so instantaneous. But I would edit that line and leave the biker if I covered it, just because 
I wouldn't want to hurt anybody. Yeah, that's understandable. But it's also, yeah, it, it, it is amazing to me just how, uh, you know, d despite the fact that these songs were written in the mid 90s, and it is now, you know, almost 2022, that you can listen to them and the subject matter doesn't come across as dated, that the, the songs themselves don't sound dated. On the contrary, I, I feel like rock music is having this renaissance right now, you know, for, for years previous, oh, rock is dead, rock is dead, what's going on? Now it is more, to me, uh, diverse, um, provocative, interesting, uh, than it's been in a long, long time. And yeah, we, we have, you know, uh, interesting, um, uh, clever Twitter personalities like Max Collins, who are drawing attention to Adam Schlesinger and Fountains of Wayne, Fountains of Wayne's legacy. Uh, there was, I, I don't know if you watched the live stream, but there was this uh, celebration of Adam's work that I, I think it was, I want to say it was early, like this past summer, maybe, or maybe in the spring. But Courtney Love was on there, uh, Butch Walker. There were all these musicians um, performing his work and the, the depth of appreciation and love that was there was so heartening. But yeah, I, I mean, I feel like now more than ever, that body of work uh, from Fountains of Wayne is th there are going to be contemporary rock musicians that are going back and visiting that and drawing from it. And I feel like we're going to, um, I'm just, I'm putting it out there. I'm sending the energy into the universe. 2022, there's going to be the, the third wave power pop. We're going to get it. And we're going to have this, this big bang of, of uh, new power pop bands. And I'm just, I'm manifesting it in the universe. I'm making it happen. Well, if they need help learning how to write songs, this is a really good how-to manual. No kidding. And, you know, not to be old man shakes a cloud, but these days, like, kids don't sit there and listen to a record in order anymore, by the way, you know, back in the day we used to do. So it's, yeah, all, about, it's... all about the single. But I I have a hard time listening to the songs on Fountains of Wayne without the ones around them. Yeah, you do, particularly when you're you're growing up with a record and yeah, but look, I remember this too, because I'm old enough that this used to be the only way that you could listen to albums was you'd buy them on a CD and you know, you'd maybe have a maximum six slots in your car stereo or whatever. So you would just kind of have to sit with an album and, and learn to appreciate it front to back. And that is, yeah, it, it, it's now a completely optional part of the listening experience for zoomers. Uh, and, you know, at me as a, a, a quote unquote geriatric millennial, <laughs> um, I like yeah, that I, I get to opt out of it too, but this is not a record where I'd want to opt out of it. it. It's just so good beginning to end. It's so unassailable. Why would you skip around? Also, I feel like they sequenced this with some intentionality. Yeah, definitely. And there's a yeah there, there is a flow to it where the more abstract chris collingwood songs or the more uh linear storytelling adam schlesinger songs they it, it proceeds in a way that feels natural and organic and yeah why why mess with that that last song almost a tearjerker everything's ruined yeah. It's kind of a love song, kind of. Yeah, a love song called Everything's Ruined. <laughs> I mean, I must be a profoundly broken person uh, because I can totally relate to that. You know, I, I think it's a beautiful way for them to have ended the record. You know, they could have just as easily made it, you know, You Cursed Girls or Don't Rock Me Tonight, both of which are sort of ha-ha funny kind of joke songs. Um, but no, I, I think it was, it, they, they did the right thing, which was to temper that humor with the melancholy, as you mentioned, that is also as much a part of the Fountains of Wayne toolbox as the, um, 
you know, the, the wry observational humor. Yep. How cool is this? We've been talking about this record longer than it would take to actually sit down and listen to the record. <laughs> There's so much there. It's a gold mine. There is. So I'm going to, before I stop the recording, I'm going to recommend one more thing. Did you know, so I don't know how long you've been listening to Dig Now. Did you know they did an episode on this album? No. You know, it must be back in the archives. It is. And I'm going to tell you and everyone listening when it is, because again, we're not really supposed to promote other people's podcasts, but <laughs> I like these guys. Um, and I, when I first discovered Dig Me Out, I actually started searching their site for my favorite 90s records. And I went back and listened to, to this episode, but it's been a couple of years and I really should have listened to it as prep for our discussion, but I didn't. So I wonder how much of the stuff we said that Tim and the other fella already said. Um, yeah, it it'll be interesting to see what what um, overlap there is between uh, Mike and Marissa and Tim and Jay. They better have called it a worthy album, or else I'm going to have to fight somebody. Oh yeah, no, what, I, those... I'm I'm certain they did. I am certain they did. You know how much those guys hate albums that are any longer than like 35 minutes. So this has got to be right <laughs> up. But it's episode 299. The date it went up was October 4th, 2016, and it is their episode where they review the self-titled Founts of Wayne debut, and they're going to tell you whether they think it's a worthy album, a better EP, or they just heard a single. So, <laughs> I think it's back-to-back -back singles, a worthy <laughs> album full of, of singles. singles. So, so here's the thing, Marissa, once you listen to that, uh, we'll have to trade some emails about our thoughts because I'm going to re-listen to it this weekend because I just remind, I just reminded myself that, yeah, they did. They discussed this already. Yeah, me too. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Thanks for coming on and chatting. And when we get to welcome interstate managers, uh, I'm going to have to have, I'm, yeah, I've decided I'm going to make this, I'm going to make a Founds of Wayne appreciation series. So when we get to welcome interstate managers, you're going to, you're going to come back and we'll talk about that, right? Awesome. I'll be here. Excellent. Yeah, I waited several months since recording that to finally post this episode. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. And to Bucks, thank you very much for coming here to talk to me. And I, I will definitely continue the Fountains of Wayne appreciation series. The next uh, episode will, of course, be about their second album because we started with their first. That makes sense, right? To the listeners, thank you very much for being here with me. Definitely go check out Fountains of Wayne, the debut album. It's a great way to spend about half an hour of your life. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Bye.